Well, today I want to talk about what I consider to be one of the most uh, important, um, if not the most important, theological challenge facing uh, the Christian faith in our contemporary culture, which is the challenge of religious pluralism. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Thus the early Christian apostles believed and thus they preached. And that name was of course the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And the conviction that salvation is to be found through Christ alone permeates the entire New Testament. For example, the apostle Paul in his letter to the church of Ephesus in the second chapter and the 12th verse invites his Gentile readers to recall their pre-Christian days. Paul says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, aliens to the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of grace, having no hope and without God in the world. What a poignant description of the status uh, of these unbelievers, having no hope and without God in the world. And it is the burden of the opening chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans to show that this desolate condition is the general situation of mankind. In chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul explains that God's eternal power and deity can be perceived through the creation around us so that all persons are without excuse for belief in the creator God. In chapter 2 and verse 15, he explains that God's moral law is also written on the hearts of all persons so that we have an instinctual grasp of the difference between right and wrong and the demands of God's moral law. In chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul explains that God offers eternal life to all who will seek for him in well-doing. But unfortunately, according to Romans 1 verses 21 to 32, rather than worship and serve the Creator God, people ignore the Creator and fashion gods of their own choosing. And rather than obey and uh, follow the moral law, men flout the moral law and plunge themselves into immorality and degeneracy. The conclusion comes in chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. All men, says Paul, whether Jews or Greeks, are under the power of sin. None is righteous. None uh, seeks for God. No one understands. All have gone wrong. Uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Moreover, Paul explains in chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, that no one can redeem himself from this uh, situation of condemnation by righteous living. Paul says, no human being shall be justified in God's sight by works of the law, uh, so that every mouth may be stopped and every uh, human being may be held accountable to God. But in chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, Paul explains that God has provided a way of escape. In God's love and mercy, he has sent Christ, whose vicarious death on the cross on our behalf is the sacrifice for our sin, thereby freeing up God's grace and forgiveness to restore our relationship with him. And so through Christ's atoning death, forgiveness and uh, life and restoration, are made possible. I could make this same point through the writings of the Apostle John and I think even through the teachings of Jesus himself but just to summarize I think the logic of the New Testament is clear. The universality of sin and the uniqueness of Christ's sacrificial atoning death entail that there is no salvation apart from Christ. Now this exclusivistic doctrine was just as scandalous in the polytheistic world of the Roman Empire as it is in uh, 21st century Western society. But in time, as Christianity grew and eventually came to supplant the religions of Greece and Rome and became the state religion of the Roman Empire, the scandal receded. Indeed, for medieval thinkers such as Augustine and Aquinas, one of the marks of the true church was its Catholicity, that is to say its universality. To them it seemed unthinkable that this great edifice filling all of the world, the Christian church, 
could have been predicated upon a falsehood. The demise of this doctrine of the exclusivity of salvation through Christ came with the so-called expansion of Europe, which refers to roughly the three centuries of exploration and discovery between about 1450 and 1750. Through the travels and the voyages of men like Marco Polo, Christopher Columbus, and Ferdinand Magellan, new civilizations and new worlds were discovered, which uh, far from believing in Christ had not so much as even heard of the name of Jesus Christ. And it was realized that far from being the universal religion of mankind, Christianity was in fact largely confined to a corner of the globe, to Western Europe. And this realization had a twofold impact upon people's thinking. First of all, it tended to relativize religious beliefs. It was thought that no religion could claim to be the absolute truth that no religion could claim to be the universal religion of mankind. Rather, every religion, or rather every society or culture had its own religion which was appropriate to itself. And secondly, it made Christianity's claim to exclusive salvation through Christ seem narrow and cruel. Enlightenment humanists like Voltaire taunted the Christians of his day with the prospect of 16 million Chinese going to hell for not having believed in Jesus Christ when they had not even heard of Jesus Christ. And in our own day, the influx into Western nations from former colonies and the advances in telecommunications which have served to shrink the world to a global village have increased our awareness of the religious diversity of mankind. It's estimated that somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of the world's population has yet to hear the gospel even for the first time. Now the most radical response to this heightened awareness of the religious diversity of mankind is religious pluralism. The religious pluralist finds it inconceivable that any one particular religion could be true and all the others false. So he advocates a pluralistic approach. Now religious pluralism comes in two forms, what we might call unsophisticated religious pluralism and sophisticated uh, religious pluralism. Unsophisticated religious pluralism responds to the phenomenon of religious diversity by saying, well, they're all true. All of the world's great religions are basically saying the same thing. Now, this view, which one frequently hears expounded by laymen and college sophomores, is frankly rooted in ignorance of what the world's great religions teach. Anyone who has studied comparative religions knows that the world views propounded by these religions are often diametrically opposite one another. Just take Islam and Buddhism, for example. Their worldviews have almost nothing in common. Islam believes that there is a personal God who created the world and is omnipotent, omniscient, and holy. It believes that man is sinful and in need of God's forgiveness that everlasting heaven or hell awaits us after death, and that we must earn our salvation by faith and righteous deeds. Buddhism denies all of these things. For the classical Buddhist, ultimate reality is impersonal. The world is uncreated. There is no enduring self. Life's ultimate goal is not personal immortality, but annihilation and the ideas of sin and salvation simply play no role at all. And examples like this could be multiplied. So clearly I think all of these religions cannot be true, for they have contradictory views about the nature of ultimate reality, the world, man, moral values, salvation, and so on. They could all be false, but they cannot all be true. Unsophisticated religious pluralism is therefore, I think, untenable. So what the sophisticated religious pluralist says is that all of the world's religions are, in fact, 
false. None of them is true. They are all culturally relative ways of misconstruing reality. Ultimate reality, which you cannot accurately call God, should be given some nondescript name like the real or the absolute. Nothing can be known about it. But the world's religions all picture it in different ways. Though literally false, all of the world's great religions are effective in transforming people's lives. Now, sophisticated religious pluralism raises a host of questions, but I want to focus on just one. Why think that religious pluralism is true? That is to say, why can't only one particular religion be true? What's wrong with religious particularism? Specifically, what's wrong with Christian particularism? Well, some of the arguments offered by religious pluralists seem to be just obvious logical fallacies. For example, pluralists will often say that it's arrogant and immoral to claim that any one particular religion is true. But this seems to be a textbook example of the fallacy called argument ad hominem, that is to say, trying to invalidate a position by attacking the character of the people who hold it. And such a pr uh, procedure is clearly fallacious. To give an illustration, suppose some medical researcher uh, manages to finally discover a successful AIDS vaccine. But suppose that this fellow also happens to be an absolute jerk. He is totally arrogant. He looks down on his colleagues because they didn't have his medical brilliance to discover the AIDS vaccine. They're metal midgets compared to him. He thinks that he ought to get the Nobel Prize in medicine for his discovery. He boasts that he is the only one, the only person who has discovered the AIDS vaccine. And so he's filled with vanity and pride for his accomplishment. Now clearly such a person would be a very arrogant individual. But would that do anything to affect the truth of his claim that in fact his AIDS vaccine is successful in treating the disease. In particular, if you suffered from the disease, would you refuse treatment because the person who discovered it was arrogant or immoral? Well, I, I think clearly not. And in exactly the same way, it's simply irrelevant to the truth of a particular religious worldview, whether its adherents are arrogant or not. That doesn't affect the truth of what they say. But in any case, why think that religious particularists are arrogant? Uh, suppose that I've done my best to figure out the truth about God and, and the world. Suppose I've researched, I've, I've read uh, the various scriptures of the world's great religions. I've looked at the evidence for their various truth claims. Suppose that I've sought God sincerely in prayer and gone through spiritual exercises in an effort to find out the truth about reality. And suppose I've come to the conclusion that Christianity is true. Well, what else can I do than believe in it? I think that it's true. What else can I do than believe in this religion that my best efforts have determined in my thinking to be true? So it's hard to see how someone can be indicted for being arrogant simply because he believes in something that he sincerely thinks to be the truth. But a final irony of this objection is that it also turns out to be a double-edged sword. For if it is arrogant and immoral to hold a religious belief which is rejected by most other people and implies that their religious beliefs are false, then it follows that the religious pluralist is himself arrogant and immoral, for he thinks that everybody else's religious beliefs are false, that the religious pluralist alone has seen the truth. The majority of the world's population who follow particular religions are all deluded and wrong. Only religious pluralists, who are after all a tiny minority of mankind, are right, and everybody else is wrong. How arrogant can you get? Well, another bad argument against religious particularism 
is that people's religious beliefs are culturally relative. For example, the pluralist points out that if you had been born in Pakistan, then you would likely be a Muslim. On the other hand, if you had been born in Ireland, you'd more likely have been, at least nominally, a Catholic. And therefore, none of these particular religious beliefs can be true. Well, again, this argument seems to be a textbook example of the logical fallacy uh, called the genetic fallacy. This is trying to invalidate a view by showing how a person came to hold that view. Such a move is obviously fallacious. For example, if you had been born in ancient Greece, then you would likely have believed that the sun orbits the earth and maybe even believed that the earth is flat. But does that therefore mean that your belief that the earth goes around the sun and that the earth is round is therefore false or even unjustified? Well, obviously not. And this argument too turns out to be a double-edged sword. For if the religious pluralist had been born in Pakistan or in Spain, then he would likely have been a religious particularist. So by his own argument, religious pluralism is false. His believing it is just the accidental result of his being born in late 20th century politically correct Western society. Now, Please don't think that because such fallacious arguments are often given on behalf of religious pluralism, that pluralism does not pose a significant challenge to Christian belief. On the contrary, I think that it does. But by clearing away these fallacious arguments, we can help to get at the real problem which is lurking in the background. That problem concerns the fate of unbelievers outside one's particular religious tradition. That problem is especially poignant for Christians who believe that salvation from sin and eternal life are to be found only through Christ's atoning death on the cross. Given the universality of sin and the uniqueness of Christ's substitutionary death on our behalf, it follows that salvation is available only through Christ. But religious pluralists find this unconscionable. Nowhere is this better illustrated than in the life of my own doctoral mentor, John Hick. John Hick began his career as a relatively conservative Christian theologian. His first book was entitled Christianity at the Center, and that was where he conceived the Christian faith to belong. But as Professor Hick began to study the world's religions, and particularly as he began to meet persons who were sincere adherents to those various religions, it became inconceivable to him that such good and decent people could be destined to eternal damnation, and that therefore the claim of the exclusivity of salvation through Christ must be false. In particular, Jesus Christ must somehow be got out of the way. He must no longer be at the center Jesus Christ must be somehow marginalized to the circumference of belief. And so Professor Hick came to write a book entitled The Myth of God Incarnate, in which he explains that he now believes that uh, the incarnation and the deity of Christ is simply a myth, a pictorial way in which Christians grasp the real or the absolute, but which cannot be understood literally. He writes the following. For understood literally the Son of God, God the Son, God incarnate language implies that God can be adequately known and responded to only through Jesus. And the whole religious life of mankind beyond the stream of Judaic Christian faith is thus by implication excluded as lying outside the sphere of salvation. This implication did little positive harm so long as Christendom was a largely autonomous civilization with only relatively marginal interaction with the rest of mankind. But with the clash of the Christian and Muslim worlds and then on an ever broadening front with European colonization throughout the earth, the literal understanding of the mythological language of Christian discipleship has had a divisive effect upon the relations between that minority of human beings who live within the borders of the Christian tradition 
and that majority who live outside it and within other streams of religious life. Transposed into theological terms, the problem which has come to the surface in the encounter of Christianity with other world religions is this. If Jesus was literally God incarnate, and if it is by his death alone that men can be saved, and by their response to him alone that they can appropriate that salvation, then the only doorway to eternal life is Christian faith. It would follow from this that the large majority of the human race so far have not been saved. But is it credible that the loving God and Father of all men has decreed that only those born within one particular thread of human history shall be saved? Hick thinks that the answer to that question is no, and therefore he came to deny the deity and incarnation of Christ. This, I believe, is the real problem posed by the religious diversity of mankind, the fate of those who stand outside one's own particular religious tradition. But what exactly is the problem supposed to be that is posed by the unevangelized or the unreached? Is it supposed to be just the idea that a loving God wouldn't send people to hell? Is that what the problem is supposed to be? Well, as I reflect on it, it seems to me that the answer is no, that isn't the core of the problem. You see, the New Testament indicates that God desires all persons to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 3.9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And in 1 Timothy 2.4, Paul explains that God's desire is that all persons be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And therefore, God seeks to draw all persons to a saving knowledge of himself. Anyone who makes a free and well-informed decision to reject God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ seals his own fate. In a sense, he is self-condemned. The only reason that he is lost is because he, God, because he resists God's will, desire, and every effort to save him. And thus his condemnation literally lies in his own hands. In one sense, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Rather, people send themselves by freely choosing to separate themselves from God irrevocably. And God mourns their loss. Well, if the idea then is not simply that a loving God wouldn't send people to hell, is it the idea that a loving God wouldn't send people to hell because they were uninformed or misinformed about Christ. Is that what the problem is supposed to be? Well, again, it seems to me, no, that isn't the essence of the problem. Because the New Testament suggests that God does not judge all persons on the basis of whether or not they have responded to Christ in faith. Because many people have never had the opportunity to respond to Christ in faith, having never heard of the gospel of Christ. And it would be manifestly unfair to judge someone on the basis of his response to something about which he's never heard. Rather, the New Testament seems to suggest that God will judge people on the basis of their response to the light that they do have. In particular, to the light of God's general revelation in nature and conscience. Remember, we saw that all persons everywhere are responsible for acknowledging at least the existence and eternal power of God the Creator and of their culpability before God on the basis of his moral law written on their hearts. And in Romans chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul says to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give eternal life. And I take it that this is a bona fide offer of salvation. That if persons who have never heard the gospel of Christ will respond appropriately to God's general revelation in nature and conscience, they will be saved. Now I hasten to add that that does not mean that people can therefore be saved apart from Christ. Rather, we've seen that only through the atoning and vicarious suffering of Christ, 
are the benefits of salvation to be found. But what this would imply is that the benefits of Christ's saving death could be applied to persons without their having a conscious knowledge of Christ. They would be like certain persons in the Old Testament. For example, Job and Melchizedek, who had never heard of Jesus Christ and yet clearly enjoyed a personal relationship with God. In fact, Job and Melchizedek were not even members of the Old Testament covenant. They were not Israelites. Uh, and yet clearly they had a personal relationship with God based upon the response that they gave to the light that they had. They were saved only through Christ's atoning death. But the benefits of Christ's death were applied to them without their having a conscious knowledge of Christ. Similarly, it could be that today there are living in the world persons who have never heard the gospel of Christ but are, so to speak, modern day Job's or Melchizedek's who respond appropriately to God's general revelation in nature and conscience and so have the benefits of Christ's death applied to them without their having a conscious knowledge of Christ. Sadly, however, I think we have to honestly admit that the testimony of the New Testament is that there don't appear to be very many people who actually do access salvation in this way. The testimony of the New Testament, as we've seen, is that people don't even measure up to these much lower standards of general revelation, so that even when judged by these lower standards, they find themselves condemned before God. Now, perhaps there are a few that do respond in an appropriate way to general revelation, and so God applies to them the benefits of Christ's blood. But I think we have to say that there is little grounds for optimism that there are very many people like this. Nevertheless, it remains the case that salvation is truly universally accessible for anyone at any time or any place in history who will simply respond to God's general revelation in nature and conscience in an appropriate way. So the problem is not simply the problem of persons who find themselves condemned because they are uninformed or misinformed about Christ. Rather, it seems to me that the essence of the problem is this. If God is all-knowing, then even before he chose to create the world, he knew who would freely receive Christ and be saved and who would not. But then certain very difficult questions arise. For example, number one, why didn't God bring the gospel to people who he knew would accept it if they heard it, even though they reject the light of general revelation that they do have. For example, consider a Native American Indian uh, living during the Middle Ages before the arrival of missionaries to this country. Let's call him Walking Bear. And let's suppose that Walking Bear looks out at the stars at night and sees the beauty of nature and the intricacy of the uh, animal and plant worlds around him, and he senses that all of this has been made by the great spirit. Moreover, as he looks into his own heart, he senses the demands of the moral law of the great spirit, telling him that all men are brothers and that he should live a life of love and uh, charity toward his fellow man. But let's suppose that instead of worshiping the great spirit and following his moral law, instead Walking Bear uh, ignores the great spirit and fashions for himself gods of his own making. And rather than worship and, and serve the uh, great spirit and live in love for his fellow man, he lives in selfishness and greed and cruelty and hatred. I think we would all agree that when judged by his response to general revelation, Walking Bear would be justly condemned before God. But now let's also suppose that if only the missionaries had arrived and shared the gospel with Walking Bear, then he would have responded and been saved. In such a case, it seems that his damnation is the result of historical and geographical accident. He just had the bad luck to be born at a time and place in history where the gospel had not yet penetrated. But surely, for him to be lost due to the accidents of geography and history is incompatible with the existence of an all-loving and all-just God. Secondly, even uh, more fundamentally, 
Why did God even create the world if he knew that so many people would not believe in Christ and be lost? Um, why not uh, create a world in which uh, fewer would be lost? Why uh, not eliminate those who would reject Christ or uh, would refuse general revelation? Why create this world if he knew that so many persons would freely reject Christ and separate themselves from God forever? Or thirdly, even more radically, why didn't God create a world in which everyone freely believes in Christ and so is saved? This would not be a puppet world or a, a marionette world uh, where there would be no free will. Rather, it's logically possible that every person in any situation that he might be in would choose uh, for Christ, would choose to believe and be saved. So why not create a world like that if God is all powerful? Uh, why not create a world in which everyone freely places his faith in Christ and is saved? Well, what are we to say in answer to these difficult questions? Does Christianity in fact make God out to be cruel and unloving? Well, in order to uh, deal with this objection, I think we need to penetrate more deeply into the logical structure of this objection. Basically, what this objection is saying is that it is impossible for God to be all-powerful and all-loving, and yet for some people never to hear the gospel and be lost. It is, in a sense, a, a type of, uh, or a, a, an example of the broader problem of evil, what we might call a soteriological problem of evil, a problem of evil pertinent to the doctrine of salvation. But why think that this is uh, impossible for God to be all loving and all powerful and for some persons never to hear the gospel and be saved? And here if we could have the first uh, overhead. The, lo the, the pluralist is basically saying that there is a logical contradiction between these two statements. A, God is all powerful and all loving and B, some people never hear the gospel and are lost. But why think that these are logically inconsistent with one another? After all, there is no logical contradiction between A and B. One is not the negation of the other. There's no explicit contradiction here. So if the pluralist is saying that these are implicitly contradictory, he must be assuming some hidden premises that would bring out the contradiction and make it explicit. But what are those hidden assumptions? Well, I have to confess that in my reading of the literature on religious pluralism, I have never encountered a religious pluralist who makes explicit what those hidden assumptions are that would serve to bring out the contradiction uh, that is alleged to be implicit between A and B. But let's see if we can help the religious pluralist out here uh, by suggesting what those assumptions might be. It seems to me that if the religious pluralist is to maintain that A and B are implicitly contradictory, he must be assuming uh, the following sort of hidden assumptions. Uh, number one, if we could have these up please. If God is all powerful, then he can create a world in which everybody hears the gospel and is freely saved. And the second assumption would be that if God is all loving, he prefers a world in which everybody hears the gospel and is freely saved. And given the truth of those two assumptions and the truth that God is all powerful uh, and all loving, it follows that everyone uh, ought to hear the gospel and be freely saved, which they are not uh, if the doctrine of uh, Christian particularism is true. But now the question arises, are these assumptions necessarily true? Are one and two necessarily true? Well, let's think about them together. Take that first assumption that if God is all powerful, he can create a world in which everybody hears the gospel and is freely saved. Now, I think we can agree that God could create a world in which everybody hears the gospel. But so long as people are genuinely free, there's no guarantee 
that everybody would be freely saved in such a world. Uh, in fact, when you think about it, there's no reason to think that the balance between saved and lost in that sort of world would be any better than the balance in the actual world. It's possible that in any world of free creatures which God uh, could create, some people would freely reject him and be lost. It is logically impossible to make someone freely do something. That, it is, that is as logically impossible as making a square circle or a married bachelor. Uh, and therefore, God's being omnipotent does not imply that he can make everyone freely do the right thing. And it's possible that in any world of free creatures that God might create, uh, some persons would freely reject him and be lost. So that first assumption is simply not necessarily true. And therefore, the argument offered by the religious pluralist is simply logically invalid. But we can go on. What about the second assumption that if God is all loving, he prefers a world in which everybody hears the gospel and is freely saved? Let's suppose that there are possible worlds which God could create in which everybody hears the gospel and freely accepts it. So that there are worlds in which everyone freely uh, responds to the gospel and is saved. Does God's being all loving compel him to choose one of these worlds to the actual world? Well, again, I think I would say not necessarily. For you see, these other worlds might have other overriding deficiencies that make them less preferable than the actual world. For example, suppose that the only worlds in which everybody would freely believe the gospel and be saved are worlds which have only a handful of people in them. And that if God were to create any more people, then at least one of them would have been lost. Does God's being all loving mean that he must prefer one of these radically underpopulated worlds over a world in which multitudes freely receive his grace and are saved, even though some will freely reject it and separate themselves from God forever? Well, that's certainly not obvious to me. It seems to me that so long as God provides sufficient grace for salvation to all persons that he creates, that he's no less loving for preferring a more populous world, even though that implies that some persons would freely reject him and be lost. So this second assumption as well is simply not necessarily true. And therefore the argument is doubly invalid and therefore, the religious pluralist has not been able to show any sort of an inconsistency between God's being all-powerful and all-loving and some people never hearing the gospel and being lost. And therefore, the argument for religious plural, uh, plural, uh, pluralism and against particularism, uh, it seems to me, is simply unsuccessful. But we can actually push our analysis a step further. I think we can show that it's entirely possible that God is all-powerful and all-loving, and that many persons do not hear the gospel and are lost. All we have to do is find a possibly true statement which is compatible with God's being all-powerful and all-loving, and which entails that some persons do not believe the gospel and are lost. Can we find such a statement? Well, let's try. As a good and loving God, God desires as many people as possible to be saved and as few as possible to be lost. His goal then is to achieve an optimal balance between these, to create no more of the lost than is necessary to attain a certain number of the saved. But it's possible that the actual world has such a balance. It's possible that in order to create this many people who would be saved, God also had to create this many people who would be lost. It's possible that had God created a world in which fewer people go to hell, even fewer people would have gone to heaven. It's possible that in order to achieve a multitude of saints, God had to accept an even greater multitude of sinners. Now, it might be objected that an all-loving God would not create people who he knew 
will be lost, but who would have been saved if only they had heard the gospel. But how do we know that there are any such persons? It's reasonable to believe that many people who never hear the gospel would not have believed the gospel even if they had heard it. Suppose then that God has so providentially ordered the world that all persons who never hear the gospel during their lifetime are precisely such people. In that case, anybody who never hears the gospel and is lost would have rejected the gospel and been lost even if he had heard it. Thus, no one could stand before God on the judgment day and complain, well, all right, God, all right, so I didn't respond to your revelation in nature and conscience, but if only I'd heard the gospel, then I would have, been, uh, would have believed. And God will say, no, I knew that even if you had heard the gospel, you wouldn't have believed in it. And therefore, my judgment of you on the basis of nature and conscience is neither unloving nor unfair. And thus it's possible, and here we have the third proposition, see that God has created a world which has an optimal balance between saved and lost, and those who never hear the gospel and are lost would not have freely received it even if they had heard it. So long as this statement is even possibly true, it proves that there is no incompatibility between an all-powerful, all-loving God and some people's never hearing the gospel and being lost. Now let me head off here a possible misunderstanding. Someone might say, well then, why engage in evangelization or missionary work if all people who are unreached would not receive Christ even if they heard of him? Well, the question forgets that we're talking only about people who never hear the gospel during their lifetime. God in his providence can so arrange the world that as the gospel spreads out from first century Palestine, God places in its path people who he knew would believe it if they heard it. But in his love and mercy, God ensures that no one who would believe the gospel if he heard it remains ultimately unreached. Once the gospel reaches a people group, then God providentially places there persons who he knew would respond to it if they heard it. He ensures that those who never hear it are only those who wouldn't have accepted it even if they had heard it. Now on the basis of this possible scenario, we're able to provide possible answers to the three difficult questions that prompted our inquiry. Let me take them in reverse order. First, why didn't God create a world in which everyone would freely receive Christ and be saved? Answer, it may not be feasible for God to create such a world. If such a world were feasible, God would have created it. But given his will to create free creatures, God had to accept that some would freely reject him and be lost. Question number two, why did God create the world when he knew that so many people would not receive Christ and be lost? Answer, God wanted to share his love and fellowship with created persons. He knew that this meant that many would freely reject him and his every effort to save them and so be lost. But he also knew that many, many others would freely receive him and be saved. And the happiness and the blessedness of those who would freely respond to his offer of salvation should not be precluded by those who would freely reject him. Those who would freely spurn God's love and grace should not be allowed to have, as it were, a veto power over which worlds God is free to create. But God, in his love and mercy, has providentially so ordered the world as to achieve an optimal balance between saved and lost by maximizing the number of those who accept him and minimizing the number of those who freely reject him. And finally, number three, why didn't God bring the gospel to people who he knew would accept it 
even though they reject the light of general revelation that they do have? Answer, there are no such people. God in his providence has so arranged the world that those who would respond to the gospel if they heard it do hear it. Those who do not respond to the general revelation in nature and conscience and never hear the gospel would not have responded to it even if they had heard it. And thus no one, no one is lost because of a lack of information or due to historical and geographical accident. Anyone who wants or even would want to be saved will be saved. Now these are merely possible answers to the questions that we posed. Is C true? Only God knows. I certainly don't know. But I think that these answers are attractive because they do seem quite biblical as well. For example, in his address on Mars Hill in Athens, the Apostle Paul spoke the following words. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and gives to all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. So in conclusion then, it seems to me that the presence of other world religions does not undermine the Christian gospel of salvation through Christ alone. On the contrary, I think that what I've said today can help to put the proper perspective upon Christian mission and evangelization. Those of us who are Christians have the duty to proclaim the gospel to the whole world, trusting that God has so providentially ordered things that through us the good news will come to persons who God knew would accept it if they heard it. Our compassion toward those in other world religions is expressed not in pretending that they are not lost and dying without Christ, but rather by our supporting and making every effort ourselves to communicate to them the life-giving message of the gospel of Christ. All right, that's uh, the remarks that I prepared. I think we can now uh, have a, a Q&A time. And I see some microphones set up there for that purpose. If you could go to the mic so everyone could hear you. Um, Professor Craig, uh, I basically disagree with underlying assumptions of your talk that uh, salvation and damnation are absolute in Christianity. And you also have a very literal reading of the New Testament. And you, you said very little about other religions other than Christianity. But the characterization of Buddhism as nihilism is a distortion. I mean, just for example, when the Abbey Hugh went to Tibet, he uh, went there to convert Tibetans who were very happy to hear about the wonderful Bodhisattva Jesus Christ and how he sacrificed himself for his people. And he, they said, this is exactly what we wish to do. Mm -hmm. We wish to renounce nirvana and renounce salvation for any personal self, which is an illusion, and live and strive for the redemption of every people and every person upon this earth. This is called the Pledge of Kuan Yin. So they didn't reject Christianity. They simply had the notion, which also Christian Gnostics do, that the Christos within is the only way to salvation. In other words, materialism, and the next topic, um, has got to be rejected because mm -hmm. deep within the self there is the spiritual soul and the booty. And so certainly the Tibetans, the wise sayings of American Indians such as Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce and Chief Seattle also have this universal view. And so instead of talking about pluralism and all these different religions which seem to be wrong in your view regarding an unprovable metaphysical assumption that we are cycled through this globe uh, for only one lifetime and then have one chance at heaven or hell, there's also the unprovable metaphysical assumption of rebirth which has a deep compassion 
about it and which Gnostics believed in, mm -hmm. that everyone will eventually wake up to the idea that Christos and Booty are universal in all men. Yeah. Well, there are a number of things that I'd like to say in response to that. Um, first of all, I wasn't trying to give any sort of an argument for what you call the metaphysical claim of the truth of Christianity. Rather, what I was trying to do was to defend religious particularism uh, against the objections of religious pluralism. And uh, actually, a Muslim could very much agree with what I said today, except he would substitute in Islam for Christianity. Uh, so that would be a talk for another day to try to actually prove that the truth claims of Christianity are true. What I'm simply trying to argue is that there isn't any kind of demonstrated incoherence in the doctrine of salvation through Christ alone. Now, with respect to Buddhism, I realize that obviously there are multifaceted uh, phases of Buddhism, that there are different kinds, uh, but what I said in my lecture was, uh, according to classical Buddhism, and I think you would agree that there are schools of Buddhism that are characterized by the doctrines that I listed. That's not to say that all forms of it are, but certainly there are some. And remember the overriding point that I was making, and I think you would agree with this, the overriding point was that all of these religions cannot be true because they make mutually incompatible claims. And that was the overriding point against unsophisticated religious pluralism, was that because these religions are uh, contradictory in their truth claims, they can't all be regarded as true. Now, the final point that I would like to make is that in all honesty, in all candor, I think it's really hard to deny that the New Testament does teach the truth of salvation through Christ alone. I mean, I, in, in some ways, I wish it didn't. But honesty is an exegete, just compels me to, to say this. Paul seems to me to be very clear. I mentioned John as well, and in the published version of this lecture, I go through a lot of the Johannine writings, and I think as well Jesus. I mean, think of Jesus' statements in the Sermon on the Mount about how he warned that we need to enter by the narrow gate because the way is broad, or the gate is broad and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in at that gate, and the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to salvation, and those who find it are few, Jesus said. So I just can't persuade myself that the way to solve this problem is to exegete the New Testament in such a way that it doesn't teach the reality of, of heaven and hell. That just seems to me to be an uncomfortable fact of the matter that one has to deal with honestly and uh, and so that's the motivation behind the talk today to try to see if there is some incoherence in holding to a partic particularistic uh, religious view. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Craig, I'm wondering, if, could we have the overhead back up for yes. my question? It'll make it easier for me to make sense. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if the pluralist is committed in the strong sense to a logical contradiction in the first case or whether he or she might be willing to say that there's an incompatibility or a contrariness, that the two can't be true at the same time. With A and B, that's part uh -huh. one of my question. Could, could the religious pluralist be driving at um, demonstrating the incompatibility of the two claims rather than the outright contradiction? Well, by by the logical incompatibility, I take it to mean that there isn't any possible world in which both of these statements are true. Absolutely. Uh, and so, in order to show that, I think that uh, the pluralist would need to give us some sort of argument to show that both of these statements cannot be true at the same time. At the same time. And that, and that was... That drives me to the second part. Yes. Of, I just kind of maybe thought weakening that would help a bit. But I'm also wondering if the assumptions that we're giving to the pluralist couldn't be also weakened and still have some force against the counterargument you've presented. For example, in number one, couldn't it be possible that we could say, if God is all powerful, he can create a world in which everyone hears the gospel and has an opportunity to be freely saved rather than is in fact freely uh -huh. saved? And then the same, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Well, you Comparable see, alteration to the second. Is right. That? Well, but I guess I wouldn't call it pluralism anymore. In fact, I would call that my view. 
Because that is the view that I defended, is that uh, God creates a world in which everybody has the opportunity, well, not to hear the gospel, but he has the opportunity to be saved. But that's the point. Everybody has the opportunity to hear the gospel and has the opportunity to be freely saved. I think that yeah. may be closer to the assumption made by the pluralist in thinking there's an incompatibility um, in the two statements above. Well, I, I guess then the, the pluralist would have to show why it would be uh, important for God to have people hear the gospel um, if the end goal in mind isn't salvation, because the view that I am defending is that salvation is universally accessible so that everybody does have the opportunity to be saved. And that, I think, is what the pluralist really wants to say, not just that, that they have the opportunity to hear the gospel. What the pluralist wants to say is they all have the opportunity to be, or, or that they actually are saved. And, um, and I'm quite willing to say that everybody has the opportunity to be saved. Okay, thank you. Yes, back to the other side. This might be terribly confused and ill-prepared, <clears throat> but on my infantile reasoning, it appears to me that we don't necessarily need um, all of the possible world stuff for the following reason, and I would like you to explain to me um, why I'm probably wrong about this. But... <clears throat> It's in regards to when you gave the example of the Native American, yes. um, and you said that maybe if he had heard the gospel, then he would have responded to God, but since he didn't hear the gospel, he, he chose not to respond. And it seems to me um, that like, if the gospel would cause someone that wouldn't have responded to respond, then it might actually be infringing upon um, our will. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, it seems like we, we don't even really need uh, all the other stuff because we could just stop at, well, people who are going to respond to the natural light, I mean, people are either going to respond to God or they're not going to respond to God. And it seems weird if we, if we start throwing in that the gospel could compel certain right. people to respond. Then we would actually maybe have bigger problems on yeah. our hands of God's justice where he only gives that extra compulsion to some people yeah. and doesn't give it to others. And in that case then it just it, it yeah. kind of seems to work itself right. out. Does that make sense? Well, I, I think it, it does make sense. I understand what you're saying, and it's a good question. But I, I don't think of the gospel uh, as something that is compelling, that it is freedom permitting. Uh, but I think that for theological reasons now, and this is an attempt to defend an orthodox biblical Christian view, for theological reasons, I think we do want to say that the proclamation of the gospel is more efficacious in winning a free response than is general revelation. Uh, otherwise, it's difficult to see the importance of the missionary task or of evangelization if, if the gospel is not more efficacious. So I don't think we want, one way to, to respond that one could have said, but I think would be theologically ill-advised, one could have said anyone who fails to respond to general revelation would not have responded to the gospel even if he heard it. Because as you say, if, if his heart is so bent and so distorted that he won't respond to God's revelation in nature and conscience, he wouldn't respond to the gospel if he heard it either, and therefore the problem is solved. And the reason I'm, I'm reluctant to go there, I guess, is just theologically I think we want to say that it's part of the Christian faith to say that the gospel is more efficacious in winning a free response from people, and that therefore there certainly are people, I think we meet them all the time, on the university campus who haven't come to, to faith, saving faith, simply through the witness of nature and conscience, but when they do hear the gospel, they say, yeah, that makes sense, and they respond to it and are, are, are saved. And so the gospel is, as Paul says, it's the power of God for salvation. And, and therefore is to be universally proclaimed. So that's why I don't want to cut short the problem by simply saying if they don't respond to general revelation, they wouldn't have responded to special. I, I think that's false. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh, yes. Uh, yes, Professor Craig, I'd like to ask a follow-up to Professor Bomstadt's question, actually. Um, it may be barely possible that each and every person who has never heard the gospel would not have accepted it 
had they heard it. But given the history of evangelism, uh, when, for example, it was introduced to South America, vast numbers of natives converted almost immediately, and we could go on and on, right? Yes. It may be barely possible, but it seems, frankly, irrational to hold that. Yeah. Uh, associatedly, then, with the weaker possible premise in the hidden assumptions. Uh, given that part of your defense against religious pluralism was the idea that people could condemn themselves by hearing the gospel and then rejecting it, it would seem that a loving, powerful God would create a world in which everyone was epistemically on a par with respect to either salvation or self-condemnation. That is, where everyone, in fact, did hear the gospel. So the mere fact that we don't live in such a world seems to be a mark yeah. against your argument. Yeah. All right. Very good question. What the uh, questioner is asking is that even if A and B are not logically incompatible with each other, nevertheless, they may be highly improbable with respect to each other. That the scenario that I've laid out is barely possible so that there isn't a contradiction. But nevertheless, it's highly improbable to think that everyone who never hears the gospel during his lifetime wouldn't have responded to it even if they had heard it. Now, it's very, very important that you understand the proposal that I'm laying out. If I were saying that it just happened to be the case that that's the way the world is by accident, I totally agree. That would be outlandishly improbable. But that's not the suggestion. The suggestion is that God, knowing how people would respond freely in various circumstances to his offers of grace, so providentially orders the world that he places people in history such that those who would respond to the gospel if they heard it are born at times and places in the world in which they do get to hear it. And given that this is not the result of accident but of deliberate planning on God's part, I can't see how the pluralist could, could say that this is improbable. He would have to say there is some sort of empirically manifest property that people have that would indicate that even though they reject general revelation, they would accept special revelation if they heard it. And I don't think there is any such empirically manifest property. Sociological studies show that persons who con con convert to Christianity are psychologically on a par with those who don't, that there isn't any peculiar religious personality type that uh, normally converts or anything. So given the proposal that I've made, I don't see how there would be any way to judge that this is improbable, that God has done this. And indeed, as, as a Christian now speaking, as I say, Acts 17 suggests that this is in fact what he's done. So I find this proposal not only a possible proposal, but I don't think it's even improbable. I think that it's, it's altogether plausible that a God who's endowed with this kind of knowledge could and would do such a thing. I think he could do it because he has knowledge of what free creatures would do in any circumstances he places them in. And I think he would do it because the scripture says that his desire is for everybody to be saved. And therefore, the only thing that would prevent that desire from coming true would be human free will and intransigence. So it, it seems to me that we can't say that this proposal is improbable, although I can understand why one's initial reaction to it might be uh, just that. Yes. Uh, Dr. Craig, I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, a kind of a possible third kind of pluralism. It's not one that's saying that all religions are true, and it's not one that's saying that all are false, but it's one that's rooted in epistemological concerns regarding justification or evidence. And so the, it would be motivated by saying there just isn't enough evidence for one religion to say that they're right and the others are wrong. Um, no one really has sufficient evidence to say that. Yeah. And so this would be you know, you think about the different world religions and how there are well thought through people. People have reasons for their beliefs and why they hold to that particular um, sect or belief system. Um, and so I'm just wondering, well, here's an analogy that might help. Uh, the Super Bowl is this Sunday, 
Um, at the beginning of the season, there are probably lots of individuals who thought that their team was going to win the Super Bowl. They had reasons for that. They had maybe some evidence. They studied the, all the draft and all that sort of thing. But it would, be, it would be out of place for somebody to say, I know that my team is going to win the Super Bowl. There just isn't enough evidence or support for that. So it's kind of a pluralism that's motivated out of that. Either that's because of divine hiddenness or yeah. some your cognitive faculties aren't able to um, ascertain the evidence or information. Yeah. Uh, the, the difficulty there, I mean, is uh, the, the connection between that and the doctrine of universalism, that all will be saved. That's what one would need to see, which I don't think you've explained. Perhaps the idea is that every person does his best with the reason and the evidence that he's been given and therefore he can't be blamed for not having believed in something for which he didn't have sufficient evidence. Well, I think two things could be said. I mean, first, I'm speaking now theologically again. Theologically, it seems to me that the New Testament does teach that there is adequate evidence for God's existence in nature and in conscience for all persons everywhere to at least believe that there is a creator of the universe and that we're morally culpable before him. But even more than that, I think that we need to call into question the evidentialism that's at the root of this question. It, it seems to me that it's quite right to say that God has created us in such a way that when our cognitive faculties are functioning properly, that they will respond to the uh, witness of the Holy Spirit that God gives to all persons so that this would naturally form belief in him and um, that God by the work of his Holy Spirit draws all persons to himself so that I don't think at root anyone refuses to come to faith in God um, or Christ through a lack of evidence. It's, it's ultimately going to be because he ignores or rejects the work and witness of the Holy Spirit uh, on his heart and that therefore, at root, it isn't a question of evidence. So your, your question, I think, would only be one that would be pressing if one had a sort of evidentialist epistemology that says that religious faith has to be based upon argument and evidence, and I, I, I don't think that's right. Is it your view that the kind of faculties that persons have are able to ascertain the Holy Spirit's moving um, in, in kind of a, there's a general grace that everyone has received and has that ability or has God chosen to give certain persons that ability? The, the former, it would be the doctrine of common grace okay. and God's universal salvific will. I take very seriously those passages in the New Testament that says that God desires all persons to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And therefore, he accords sufficient grace for salvation to every human being that he creates. And he gives them gifts of grace and um, um, ministrations of the Holy Spirit, which are sufficient to draw them to a saving knowledge of himself if that person is willing. And it's only by rejecting these that anyone would be ultimately lost. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. They told me till 1.20, but I'll be happy to just uh, hang around and uh, can talk personally with anybody afterwards. But thank you very much for your attendance today.